Hello, my name is uh, Mark Parnell from the uh, Weatherhead School of Management, and I'm pleased to introduce Jeff Hoffman. Uh, Jeff Hoffman is a successful entrepreneur, proven CEO, worldwide motivational speaker, Hollywood film producer, and a producer of a Grammy-winning jazz album in 2015. In his career, he has been the founder of multiple startups, he has been the CEO of both public and private companies, and he has served as a senior executive in many capacities. Jeff has been a part of a number of well-known companies, including Priceline.com, ubid.com, CTI, ColorJar, and more. Today, Jeff serves on the boards of companies in the US, Europe, South America, Africa, and Asia. He supports entrepreneurs and small businesses on a worldwide basis, serving on the global board of directors of Global Entrepreneurship Week, supporting entrepreneurship in over 130 countries, the US State Department's GIST program, Global Innovation Through Science and Technology, working in 49 emerging nations, the APEC Startup Initiative, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperative's 21 member national association, and many others. He supports the White House, the State Department, the United Nations, and similar organizations internationally on economic growth initiatives and entrepreneurship programs. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Hoffman. Yeah, it's up here. Looking, looking for the slide clicker. Uh, morning. Um, it's uh, really nice. I have been on the. Uh, Hang on, I'll make sure that my slides are in that, yes. And uh, on the road a lot, uh, Mike, I made a commitment to sort of giving back by mentoring entrepreneurs, and I've been traveling usually a different country every week mentoring entrepreneurs, but I have a home right here in the area, and it's really nice to be in my own backyard uh, right here on campus. As a matter of fact, uh, last night's mentoring session was with uh, some Case Western entrepreneurs, uh, uh, Chris uh, Wentz and the Every Key team with Chris and Daniel and Craig. We did a mentoring session last night. So. Bob Sopko asked me to talk about kind of, the topic said behind the scenes look at the life of an entrepreneur, but what I decided to do instead along those lines was just talk about the things that as an entrepreneur uh, that I have learned to focus on. I've been doing this for a long time. I had a very brief uh, career in corporate America. I got an engineering degree in college. Uh, I funded my college education through my first startup. Not because I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but just I couldn't afford the college I went to. So I started a software company as a college freshman, funded my education. But when I left, I got an engineering job at a big engineering company. Uh, and for me, there's no right or wrong, but it was definitely a DNA thing. Um, I, it just didn't work for me. I told somebody the other day that it turns out corporate America just doesn't value my 27 DNA strands of sarcasm the way that I value it. Um, it is not, in fact, an effective tool in the corporate world. Um, so I left when I was 20-something years old. I've been doing startups ever since. <clears throat> Pretty much in tech and consumer. I've done eight of them. Uh, we had two that were acquired, um, two that we took public, uh, two that failed miserably, um, and two that are still going. So I've been in this startup business a long time. I've made every mistake you can make three different times. Um, and along the way, we got a few things right. Uh, most people know the biggest startup I was a part of was that one. That's the one that most people know. We were able to eventually scale that company to do business in about 180 different countries. Uh, and today it's a multi-billion dollar operation. But it was a company that was started from scratch as well. And we learned a lot along the way that we share. Since uh, in 2012, I sort of finished my final startup and made a decision that uh, I wanted to. I'd made a commitment to giving back. Uh, you know, I think entrepreneurship is a privilege, not a job. Um, and I used to tell people, I don't have to go to work, I get to go to work. Uh, because I loved what I was working on every single day, and I was very energized by it. So I made a commitment to giving back by mentoring entrepreneurs. So in 2012, I <clears throat> took off and I said, I'm going to take this year off. And this was my great social experiment. I'm going to spend a whole year trying not to say no to any entrepreneur that asks me for help with anything. So I won't do any work through this year. And I don't know where I'll be in any given week, wherever the next phone call is. Uh, but I was going to give back by mentoring. That turned into an idea. I started getting calls from other countries. Um, uh, like, you know, recently I was meet with entrepreneurs in Israel, in Pakistan, in uh, Russia, in Morocco. I'm on the way to Tunisia, Tunisia Ma Malaysia after this. So when I started doing this, I got interested in best practices. 
If you go around the world, and I visit universities in every one of these countries, if you look at universities, local ecosystem and local entrepreneurs, what are the best practices? How are, are when, where entrepreneurs and communities and ecosystems and universities are all working together to create jobs, to create innovation, how are they doing that and what can we learn from it? So that one year uh, idea has turned into three years. The last three years, I've just been studying innovation, entrepreneurship, mentorship, university programs, et cetera, uh, to try to see what the best practices are. That's like, for example, the, the tour I did in Israel was I went and spoke at the universities there, but I visited all these universities to figure out how that country became startup nation. When I was in India, I did a seven city tour, visited universities and cities there to figure out how they're teaching entrepreneurship. So that being said, what I want to do, and again, to, to Bob's uh, point, by the way, I do have to say this. I'm sure Bob is in the room somewhere, but Bob Sopko is definitely the reason that I'm here today. And I can't tell you how many places I've gone to support entrepreneurial efforts where uh, Bob Sopko was in the room representing not only Case Western, but Northeast Ohio and all of our efforts as a team. So I got to tell you, we are very lucky to have him here in our midst. It's kind of funny. I did a, we did an event last year in Las Vegas, uh, a tech challenge that I did with Richard Branson and his team. And there was Bob in Vegas with all the Northeast Ohio entrepreneurs at the Consumer Electronics Show. After, recently, we did an event that we did a tech challenge, or excuse me, an innovation challenge that we did with the Dalai Lama. So I went to New York for this event with the Dalai Lama, and there's Bob Sopko with a team right here from this campus that made the finals of that event as well. So uh, I, I really applaud the efforts across Northeast Ohio and, and here on campus to support entrepreneurship. So when Bob said to me, uh, you know, give the behind the scenes look at an entrepreneur's life. What I decided to do kind of like that is just show you the things that I have learned. And these are lessons not just for myself, but from studying a lot of successful entrepreneurs. These are the things that successful, to be successful, you should spend your time on as an entrepreneur. So that's kind of the way I did this because, uh, again, if it was a behind the scenes look, this is what you would have seen me doing anyway along that line. So let's start with the first one. Uh, the first one, a as an entrepreneur, and I think for what I notice about successful entrepreneurs, the first thing is looking for real problems to solve. And the reason that I put that, you see I put real problems in italics. All of us see, I, I talk to entrepreneurs every single week and listen to their pitches. And so many times I hear uh, uh, a solution that's looking for a problem. People say to me, entrepreneurs say, isn't this thing cool? And we say, it's cool, but there might be two people on the planet that actually care or would use it, and neither one of them would even pay for this kind of thing. We see a lot of people fascinated by their own ideas, fascinated by their technology, and just seeing if there's a home for it. So we start at the wrong end of the funnel. We start with something cool we came across, and then we try to hope someone out there in the world wants it. Uh, the best entrepreneurs start at the other end. They're out engaged in the world, and they're constantly looking for a problem that no one has solved and saying, I can do that. In fact, I'll tell you the behavior I noticed of the best entrepreneurs. The best, what most people do when you see a problem is you go home and complain, and that's where it ends. How was your day, honey? It was horrible. I had to stand in three, I stood three hours in line waiting for those idiots, okay? And we tell everybody, somebody might tweet it or put it on their uh, Facebook status. Bad day, those idiots made me stand in line for three hours. But what do we do? We complain and go back to work. Here's what entrepreneurs do that's different, the most successful ones. Constantly, when they experience a problem, they're stopping and asking the following questions. Is this problem, does this problem bother anybody but me? And if the answer is yes, entrepreneurs ask the second question. Is there a solution? And maybe I just don't know it. And if the answer to that is no, entrepreneurs do something everybody else doesn't. They say, you guys go on without me. I'm going to stay here until I fix this. OK, so the best entrepreneurs are constantly looking around and saying, what's a problem in the world that bothers everyone that no one seems to have fixed? And that's where they find opportunities. I'm going to give you an example. When I quit corporate America, and I, I was 20-something years old, this was my first startup. I was uh, going to the airport, and I got in line uh, to get, a, get my boarding pass at the airport. It took 58 minutes. At the end of 58 minutes, I got to the front. I gave the lady my driver's license. And she said, Hoffman, and hit print, and a boarding pass printed. And I said, seriously, you made me stand there for an hour so you could print a sheet of paper? She said, well, you can't get on a plane. You can't go through security without a boarding pass. I said, right, but I stood here an hour for you to print something. And she said, sir, that's the way it works. And I said, it's a printout. Why don't you just put the printer over there, and I'll do it. And she said, it doesn't work that way. So I turned all the people in line behind me, which looked like that. 
And I said, am I the only one upset about standing here an hour to get a printed sheet of piece of paper? And everybody groaned. And I said, let me ask you guys a question. I was just talking to the angry people in the airport, especially the business people. Plus, I was holding up the line, making them angrier. I said, would you give me five bucks if I could give you a boarding pass right now and you could skip this line? And people in the back were yelling, 10, 15, 20. And I said, I'll be back, OK? So this was my first product. We designed, patented, and started selling in airports all over the world those kiosks that you use today to get your boarding pass. Um, today, I still get texts from people that say, hey, thanks, dude. I just ran to the airport and got my boarding pass from a machine. We looked at a problem that was real in the world that bothered lots of people that there didn't seem to be a solution for, and that's what we spent our time on. Go find a problem that people in the world have that are bothered by and that they would pay you if you would fix it. When people were yelling, I'd give you 10 bucks to get me out of this line, 15 bucks, I was like, this is a business, OK? Because people care about it. It solves a problem with, with, that doesn't have a good solution, and it has value. People would pay me to do this thing. So that was our first, that was our first company. And that was my first, again, 20-something years old. And again, I, you know, I, I'm not a. I'm not a money guy at all. I've never been driven by it at all. But I'm just going to say this just to sort of show the result of creating value. Uh, again, first startup, 20-something years old, and we were able to sell this company for $100 million. Um, it's not internet money, but when you're in your 20s and someone says, you have created value, we would like to pay you for that, that's not a bad thing. Uh, that, that led us to say, let's go solve some more problems that bother a lot of people that someone will pay you for. So I think that's the first thing that successful entrepreneurs do. And that's, you know, when, when Bob said to me, talk about sort of the behind the scenes look at an entrepreneur's life, that's what I spend my time doing. We have sessions where we sit and talk about problems that are in the world, and is there a solution for them, and can we be that solution? And is it a business if we solve that problem? We spend a lot of time paying attention to things that bother us in the world that other people just complain and go back to their office. Um, second, probably most important piece, and where I really spend my time personally, um, which is building great teams. Uh, and, and here's the lesson. When I started, I was the CEO, right? So if somebody asked somebody, who do you work for? They'd say, I work for Jeff. And I thought my job as the CEO was to run the business. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to skip all the middle, all the mistakes, and all the hard lessons, but I'm going to tell you the end of this. What I learned was that your job as a leader is not to run the business at all. You should not be doing all these things. You're not even good at them. Every one of us is good at one thing. And when you start a company, you have to do 11 things because there are no other people there. So that's why people get stuck in that trap of running the business themselves. And the truth is, there's one position you can play on the team. And from day one, you should be looking to hire people smarter than you in every other area. Right? So what I've learned since then is my job isn't to run the company at all. My job is to get people smarter than me and then get out of their way in effect, OK, is to enable those people to do their job. Um, when I started thinking about it, well, I'll tell you a quick story. When I, when I sold that company I just told you about, I was doing TV interviews You know that television loves, media loves young people selling companies for lots of money. It's a sexy story in the tech world. So I'm doing a media interview. And the reporter is telling me, reading all our numbers, you have this much pro increase in profits and revenues and sales and margins, all financial stuff. She said, great accomplishments as a leader, CEO. Which of these things are you most proud of? And I, rem I remember, I'll tell you what I said. When I was driving to the TV studio that day, the woman that ran HR for me called me and said, Jeff, this is amazing. I just ran the numbers. And I said, what? And she said, in all the years since you started this company, from the day you started it to the day you sold it, not one person that worked here has ever quit. And I said, well, that is the single coolest thing I have ever done. I don't even know how I did that. I started calling people and saying, why don't you people ever quit? And they were laughing and saying, do you want us to leave? I said, no, I just don't understand. We fire non-performers, but no one ever leaves voluntarily. So they explained to me the things what we were doing. And I realized my job was no longer to run the company. My job as a leader is to build a place where the best people in the industry who could work anywhere they want all want to work here. And to build a culture where they never want to leave. That became my new assignment. Right? So I, I want to kind of tell you, you know, it's the, it's the servant leader model. It's the inverted pyramid. I'm at the bottom 
not the top. My job is to serve smart people who could work anywhere they want to work and make sure I create an environment where they feel important and valued and rewarded and respected and challenged, right, and have fun, all the things that matter to them. So I want to tell you a quick sort of story about that. Um, I uh, used to write the entrepreneurship and innovation column for Inc. Magazine. And one of the times, uh, Inc. told me, write a story about talent, right? Because I had told somebody that funding is not the world's uh, scarcest resource by a long shot. Talent is. I can find money way more places than I can find immensely talented, passionate people. They're way harder to find and then to keep. So here's what I wrote. I wrote the article for Inc. And the title of the article, if you go out there and look at it, it says, hire the best and then pick up their laundry. And people said, what exactly do you mean by that? And I just want to tell you guys the story. Um, I was on the road, and my team called. And they said, we met this 20-year-old whiz kid, best developer programmer we've ever met. I said, don't wait for me, just hire him. Right? So while I was gone, they hired this, this young kid, 20-year-old guy. Um, when I got back to the office, I had not met him. This kid didn't know that I was the CEO or the owner of the company. And we had never seen each other. So I went walking down to the conference room where they were all working. Actually, we called them war rooms instead of conference rooms because they would be in there you know, preparing to do battle in the marketplace. So they were all in the war room. And I went down there and I said, can I get you guys anything? Now, in our culture, uh, that means pizza and Diet Coke, which many a startup have been fueled by. Um, and they didn't realize, again, this kid didn't know that I was the CEO or the owner. And when I said, can I get you anything, the 20-year-old kid said, yeah, could you go pick up my dry cleaning? And all my team kind of looked like that. You can't ask the CEO to go run your errands and pick up your dry cleaning. So they're all waiting to see what I was going to say. And I said, sure, where's the ticket? And he said, it's in my cubicle, pinned to the wall. I said, I'll see you guys in 20 minutes. So I'm walking out. My vice presidents all come running after me. And they said, Jeff, you're picking up that kid's dry cleaning? And here is what I said. This is what I had learned. I said, let me tell you guys something. I said, that kid is the single most brilliant developer I have ever seen. I said, that kid right now is creating products that we will win awards for. I said, that kid is going to make everybody in this building rich and famous, if that's what you care about. I said, so not only am I going right now to pick up this kid's dry cleaning, but when I get back, I'll be outside washing his car. <laughs> um, that is what, the, what, what successful leaders do is they spend their time figuring out how to build an environment that attracts the best and then taking care of them so they never want to leave. The biggest compliment I ever got was finding out that no one ever quit my company uh, during all those years. And that became my working orders. It's not my job to run the company. I have one position to play on the team. I actually was pretty good at marketing. So I spent my time there. But I got people smarter than me in every other area and let them do their thing. And my job was to say, how can I make this even better for you so you love coming to work every single day? That's what leadership does spend their time on. And by the way, along the way, I learned this along those same terms. Um, we never chased money. We always chased excellence. And the reason I say that is, uh, and I don't know why they keep inviting me back to Silicon Valley to give talks, because I keep telling them the disservices they do, along with all the great things. But I recently, not that long ago, was asked to give a talk at Stanford. Uh, and I said this same thing. Silicon Valley, because it's investor driven, has created this climate where everybody's, all they're all talking about is the exit, is the return. How much money are we going to make on this? How much money are we going to make on it? People that haven't even built a product yet have a slide that says exit strategy. And other people in here have heard me say this before. I always say exit strategy. What is your entrance strategy? You don't even have a business and you're selling it already? That's like going to the car dealership the minute after you buy a lottery ticket at the convenience store and you're picking out cars. You might want to wait and see if you actually win the lottery first. Um, we have this focus on the exit and the money and everything else. And the simple truth is that, that people that are chasing money in the startup world, there are a lot of days where you look and we say, we're not making a dime. No one's paying us. It looks bleak. If all you're there, if you're only in it for the money, you'll quit because you don't see any money. I started to notice that the most successful entrepreneurs never started their sentence with, well, I was just hoping to get rich. They were chasing excellence, the problem they wanted to solve, a legacy they wanted to leave, a part of the world they wanted to make better. When you chase excellence, I always told all my people, heads down and build something excellent. If we do that, 
we'll never have to worry about an exit strategy. That first company I told you about, I just looked up one day and there was like 15 people in suits that cost more than my entire first product cost. Um, standing there, they said, we're the mergers and acquisitions division of a multi-billion dollar organization. We want to buy your company. I never once said the word exit, talked about it. What we did was we built excellence. We built amazing products that created value in the marketplace that a lot of people liked. When you chase excellence, the money will follow and it will show up. So you got to be heads down on excellence. And, the, and let's talk about how you do that. One of the first, one of the most important lessons I've learned about how to achieve excellence <clears throat> is to win a gold medal. I'm going to do, there's two concepts here. One is winning a gold medal and the other is at one thing. Today, entrepreneurs, and especially in this sort of, I don't know, really high speed, you know, uh, world where ideas go by all the time and, and we're so bombarded with messaging, entrepreneurs come up to me and they say, Jeff, I'm working on these six different ideas, six great ideas. And I tell them the same thing every time, get rid of five of them and go execute one. Okay. By the way, it says on the wall in my office, one of my core beliefs says ideas are welcome, but execution is worshiped. Everybody's got an idea. Nobody builds anything statistically compared to the number of times you've been sitting with friends at dinner over a glass of wine and everybody's got an idea and you, where will they be next week over the same glass of wine talking about the idea they still have done nothing about execution is the key to success. Executing one thing well is really hard. So what do you think it takes to execute six things well? You are not going to launch six companies at once and be equally successful. The most successful people pick one thing and do it until it is done, something they can win a gold medal at. Excellence is achieved by standing out in the marketplace, by building something that's better than anybody else has built it before, the way you solve the problem. You got to win a gold medal at something. So what I, what I tell entrepreneurs all the time is figure out something you can win a gold medal at. What is, and stop working on six things at once. They say to me, well, someone will steal my ideas. And I tell them, then you can own one six of six things, and in the end, you'll own 100% of nothing. Or you can let those go, succeed at one thing, and when you do, you'll have six new ideas anyway, right? Sometimes some of the ideas we let go, we saw someone else take them. But meanwhile, we were winning a gold medal in our thing. Let me give you a couple of quick examples. Back in the early internet days, there were not a lot of people building internet companies, so we all talked all the time. I remember conversations with, uh, with uh, Pierre and Jeff. They were building eBay at the time, the founders of that. I had conversations with uh, Jeff Bezos when he was building Amazon. And, and let me just sort of tell you something about, the, about winning a gold medal at one thing first. I, there were some kids uh, in front of me at a, at a store in Solon, a grocery store. And uh, I said to these kids, I always do my market research everywhere I am all the time, just talking to people, remember? Because you're always scanning the horizon for a new problem to solve. And I said, you guys shop at Amazon? And the kids said, teenagers, kids said everyone shops at Amazon. And I said, what can you buy at Amazon? And the kids said, everything, if you can think of it, Amazon sells it. And I said, do you think I could buy books at Amazon? And I kid you not, the younger kids said, books are lame, Amazon doesn't sell those. <laughs> I said, I'm pretty sure they sell books. He said, I doubt it. And I said, no, I'm pretty sure they sell books, right? So now you go back to a conversation. Amazon is the, inner, the marketplace of everything. But I can tell you, the opening statement way back when, when we were all talking, what Bezos said was, we are going to be the best darn bookseller on the planet. All they did was sell books. But what they did was they won a gold medal at e-commerce. It was such a great experience that we, the people, said to Amazon, I know it was just a book, but I really like doing business with you. Can you sell me something else, please? We pulled them. Instead of pushing something out in the world and hoping someone buys it, they pulled Amazon towards them. We did and said, I love doing business with you. It was just a book, but it was a gold medal e-commerce experience. What else you got? He got there by winning a gold medal at something. I'll give you another example. Um, actually, uh, uh, my next talk from here is an event that I'm doing in Malaysia with a guy named Tony Shea. Uh, Tony created Zappos.com. And Tony and I talk about this stuff a lot. Um, Tony's opening statement was, we are going to be the best darn shoe seller on the planet. Their only product they sold at the beginning was shoes. Today they sell all kinds of women's clothing and accessories because what the market said when they won a gold medal and became the best service company to do business with, 
They said, look, it's only shoes, but that was gold medal service. I wish I could buy everything from those people. And they pulled them into other product lines. So it's important to find one thing to be the best at, not six things. Win a gold medal at something. When you win a gold medal at something, the world comes to you for everything else. Um, and it's important to do that. We get too many people, too many entrepreneurs that are trying to launch six, six. People say to me, you've done a whole bunch of things. It's true, but not at once. I, I you know, was never a parallel entrepreneur. I have used the term serial entrepreneur on purpose, right? We did one, then we did another. And we were always focused on the excellence of one thing. So let me give you a, 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 another tip on something we do internally. Uh, again, when Bob was saying, you know, what are you guys doing behind the scenes? I'll show you what we're doing behind the scenes. We're focusing on operational excellence by making sure that everything we do is tied to our goals. And let me explain to you what this means. I was, at the time, uh, on, on giving a speech. And this time, it was a guy that I was speaking with named Jim McCann. Uh, there are 25,000 FTD florists in the U.S. At, at, when he started, he had one flower shop in New York. He was number 24,000 in volume. All right. Today, his company, 800 Flowers, is the world's leading seller of flowers. They sell more flowers than any company in the entire world. My question was, how did you get there? There were a variety of answers, but I'm going to share the one with you that meant the most to me. Jim, they invited me out to their facility. And Jim said, part of the way we got there is by making sure two things. One, that our goals and objectives are always visible. If you go to my office now, the things we have to do during the next 90 days are all over the walls everywhere. You can't be in the office and not know what's important to get done next, what drives the business. He said, then we make sure that every activity every employee does every day is leading towards one of those goals. So here's how he showed me. We're walking down the hall. He stops an employee. He says, what are you doing right now? And the employee tells him. And his business, his objective is to sell more flowers. And he says, how does the activity you are doing right now at my company help us sell more flowers? If the person can't answer that, he says, put that down and go do something else. OK? And if they can, he says, carry on. So we go in the garage. This was the most surprising one. There are, it's delivery vans. There's a mechanic covered in grease on a board underneath a delivery van. He says, watch this, Jeff. And he calls the guy out and says, what are you doing? And the guy says, I'm putting fuel filters on delivery vans. And he says, and how exactly does that sell more flowers? And here's the answer that I loved. The mechanic said, well, I was doing research on the internet. And I found these new fuel filters that save $13 off of every tank of gas per delivery truck when it's out for the day. And he said, they cost 5 bucks in bulk. So I bought them. I paid the 5 bucks, had $8 in savings left over. I'm giving three back to the company, and I'm taking the other $5 to give to every customer $5 off of shipping for your order. He said, I'm pretty sure a $5 off of shipping coupon will sell more flowers. OK, that is amazing focus. So we do this all the time in our companies. In fact, I don't even use ours. We use that. It says sell more flowers on the wall, because everyone that works for me knows what that means. We walk down the hall and saying, what are you doing today to sell more flowers? And if you don't know the answer to it, put it down and do something else. Operational excellence comes from every activity being focused on the thing that drives your success. And anybody that can't answer that question, put it down and do something else. That's how you achieve operational excellence in the marketplace. The next thing I want to tell you that we spend a lot of time doing is harvesting ideas. I was just going to ask if there was water up here. And there's like 48 bottles that I see under. Of course, this is a Lisa event. So of course, there's 48 bottles of water there. Um, harvesting ideas. Uh, innovation, most people think of innovation as this thing that happens when you're in the shower, right? Oh, I had an idea. In fact, what used to drive me crazy in my short stay in corporate America is we'd be in a meeting conference room waiting for the boss to come in. And we'd be talking. And somebody would say, oh, wouldn't it be cool if you could do this and this? And we'd have all these great ideas. Then the meeting and start would start. And you know what would happen? Boom, it was like a bug zapper. All the moths going into a bug zapper. All the ideas stopped because the boss would say, OK, everybody, calm down, meeting time. And I was like, why does no one ever follow up on these ideas? In order to keep innovating, you have to keep harvesting ideas, which means that you have to plant them, you have to water them, seed them. Some will die, and some will make it. But you've got to keep planting seeds of ideas out in front of yourself. So I came up with this technique. I'll tell you really quickly. I just made up this word called info sponging. Here's what I do to ensure that I always have new ideas coming for when I need them, for coming what's next. I only do info sponging once a day. 
and I do it for the first 10 minutes of every day. If you can't, don't have 10 minutes a day, the whole rest of your time is spent on selling more flowers, executing your business. But for a few minutes a day or a week, take a look at the world around you. Here's what you're trying to do. See if someone else somewhere else came up with an idea that's so good that you could be the first person to bring it to your industry. Okay, so I make it a point every single day I read some article online usually that I have no reason to read. It's not in my industry. It's not in my purview. If someone said, hey, one of the days I read this thing about perishable commodity distribution. It was a story on how to sell fruit. I don't sell fruit, okay? So if someone said, you want to read this article on selling fruit, I would have said no. The point of info sponging is learn one new thing every day. Whatever strikes your curiosity, I write it down, and every day I look at it, right? And I say, is there something here? They're puzzle pieces. If I give you a piece of a puzzle today and said, what is this thing? You'd say, I don't know. It just gave you a blue puzzle piece. If I gave you two or three pieces, you don't know. But one day, pushing all the pieces around the table in the different ways, one day you're going to say, Jeff, it's going to be an Irish castle. I just figured it out. That's what we're doing with info sponging. You study things going on in the world around you. You push those pieces around. By the way, I can take you to a day. I don't think I have that slide, per se. Um, I can take you to a day sitting in Connecticut uh, with Jay Walker at Walker Digital, um, which is where we spun Priceline out of when we were all there pushing puzzle pieces around the table. And remember that story about selling fruit? It was a story about how to distribute perishable commodities. And I remember thinking, you know what's more perishable than fruit? A banana lasts all week, an airplane seat. Because as soon as you close the door, all the goods are spoiled. We applied the things we learned in the world around us. We studied distressed inventory, perishable commodities, dynamic pricing. And in the end, we built a distressed inventory, perishable commodity, dynamically priced distribution system that today is worth $65 billion, that company. It came from taking disjoint ideas in the world around us, synthesizing them into something new. So harvest ideas. Uh, next part I want to tell you about is immersing yourself in the marketplace. And here's what's important there. I was doing another TV interview. The, the, there's other CEOs. The reporter said, um, when, you think of, when you hear a good idea, what's the first thing you do? All the CEOs in the room said, I gather my team and go to the conference room. I said, I get my car keys and go to the parking lot. And everybody looked at me like, you get your car keys and go to the parking lot? And I said, yeah, and I just want to tell you guys where I learned that story here. The, uh, at, at this moment in time, I was working with an elderly gentleman in the retail business. And I asked this guy, I said, your business defies all the experts. All the experts on Wall Street said, you keep had retail stores that were working, but he built them in a way that everyone said you can't do it. Wall Street, the experts, everyone in retail said, you can't build stores this way, they will fail. But they worked. So I said to this guy, how did you know this would work? And he said, Jeff, a farmer in a John Deere hat told me. And I said, OK, I've got to hear this. So me and this gentleman sat down over lunch. And <clears throat> he said, Jeff, that's my office. That's what my company looks like. I have MBAs from schools like Weatherhead, right, that help me with supply chain logistics, which is stuff I need. And I said, OK, what's the problem? He said, the problem is that's my customer, wearing a John Deere hat and overalls in a cafe, in a diner, eating apple pie. He said, these people don't know these people. They're not them. These people don't shop near these people. They don't live near these people. They don't eat at the same restaurants. I said, so what did you do? And this gentleman said, Jeff, every other Friday, I would change into jeans, put on a farmer's hat, go to cross town to the diner, and buy people apple pie, and just sit in the diner all day talking to people. He said, those farmers told me how to build my stores. The interesting part of the lesson is the guy I was spending a day with was named Sam Walton, and his little idea was Walmart. And at the time, Wall Street said, you can't build big box retail in small town America. And what Sam did was he didn't ask Wall Street. He let the farmers told him, make the store with this, this, and this, and we'll shop there. And it worked. So what is the lesson from that? And then I'll cover just my last point really fast here. The lesson from this is spend time outside of your office and quit being caught up in the brilliance of your own ideas. It doesn't matter how brilliant you think the idea is if you need a farmer in Fayetteville, Arkansas to actually shop there. Spend your time with farmers in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Even when we were building Priceline, we would go across town to Kmart and Walmart and discount stores and just chat with people, not in our business suits, just chat with people in discount stores about how they would buy discount travel. Let the market tell you how to build the product, not your own team, not your own thoughts and ideas. You can't build it from the conference room out. You build it from the customer in. The last thing I want to say, and I'll close with this, uh, because uh, uh, you know, um, both uh, actually Lisa and Bob brought this up as well, is it is important to have balance as well. 
Um, we work, when we're working on these things, when you're launching a startup, you are off the face of the earth. You know, this is the only thing you can live, sleep, eat, drink, and breathe all the time, but that's actually not healthy. Uh, you gotta find time to recharge your battery and to have some balance. So, well, seven of my companies were tech companies. I will say that one of them, we took a break from tech. I just wanted to step away, refresh my thinking, my method of approach. I was too lost in the weeds to be effective anymore. So I'm gonna tell you in the middle of all this, we took a break and created an entertainment company. Uh, and I know you mentioned this during the, uh, uh, during the intro, but it was another startup for me. That's one of the movies we made. That's me being killed in the movie. I'm bleeding from a head wound there. Uh, we took time out. We went to Hollywood. We learned marketing. We made movies uh, in that entertainment company. We also went out and created music. And that's actually the moment that I won the Grammy. I'm standing there on the red carpet taking pictures of all the paparazzi. Uh, I'll end by saying, somebody said, how does it feel to win a Grammy? And I said, this is the dream of Midwestern software engineers everywhere. <laughs> To which not one reporter, they just went, what? But I got to tell you, it was a funny moment to be standing there. It was important for me to take a break from what I do and come back to it later. Um, that's kind of the summary. Uh, oh, you know what? I'm going to skip that one for now in the interest of time. Um, the summary is uh, keep looking for problems to solve. Like we said, build great teams, nurture them. That's your job. Win a gold medal at one thing. Sell more flowers. Maintain your operational focus. Always harvest new ideas and spend time hanging out with your customers, not selling to them. Um, I am going to stay. Uh, we're out of time, right? Um, I'm going to stay with you guys at this. I'm going to stay the rest of the day. But I'm going to stay at this break since we don't have time for QA. We're going to go to a break now. And I'll hang out back there and take any questions since we didn't have time to do them here. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>